It's just a huge honor for me today to bring back Dave Monahan of Clear. Clear is an advanced cloud-based platform that enables dentistry to easily design and manage their own membership plan and offer it directly to their patients. Clear is turnkey and free to implement. Clear's mission is simple. Partner with dentists to increase the value of their practices by making dental care accessible and affordable to everyone. Dave has a passion for creating technology-enabled businesses that improve people's lives. Prior to joining Clear, Dave served as the president and CEO of Fit Lenox, a leader in the wearables market, where he created simple, affordable, and connected wearable devices for the medical and sports market. FitLink's devices enabled patients to monitor and manage chronic conditions and athletes to monitor and improve their performances. Dave is a graduate of the Pennsylvania State University and Loyola University and resides in the greater Philadelphia area in Wayne, Pennsylvania. Dave is married and has three children, ages 12, 14, and 16. When Dave is not coaching his kids' teams, he finds time to exercise, travel, and play any sport or competitive activity that he or his friends can dream up. Guess what the new sport is in Ahwatukee that's going crazy? I don't know. Uh, what do they call it? Pickleball? Pickleball. I've heard of it. I don't know it. Oh, my God. They, I mean, it's just gone from nothing to everything in Ahwatukee. Uh, I mean, and in fact, you know how crazy it is? You can't get the city of Phoenix. You know, it's hard to get anything done with the government. They just uh, announced they're going to build like a $100,000 of pickle courts at our local <laughs> uh, city park here in Ahwatukee. Is that like tennis? Yeah. I, it's like tennis for old people. The courts are smaller. Oh, don't say tennis for okay. old people, right, Ryan. <laughs> Come on, Ryan. Just because I'm 55. But, uh, so, Dave, I brought you back because, um, you know, my buddy um, – who wrote the book, The Four Horsemen of Dentistry, is talking about that. You know, it's kind of a perfect storm. You have a huge um, increase in number of dental graduates. Um, indemnity insurance is gone. It's all gone to PPO, and the average fee is about 42% lower than their fee schedule. And, uh, and then, you know, inflation every year, a solid 2%, and that's just according to the Fed. And the Fed is, uh, in my opinion, notoriously uh fudges their numbers for instance i'll give you some examples they do like um when housing when when uh, uh dwellings there's 325 million americans they live in about 150 million dwellings um as apartment prices went up they kept them stable showing no inflation because they factored in that the apartment was bigger and when you looked at that bigger they didn't go with square footage they went with volume because yeah. the ceilings you know when we were little all those ceilings were eight foot high, nine foot high. Now those apartment ceilings can be vaulted ceilings. And it's like, really, dude, you're, you're increasing <laughs> the volume metric of an apartment. So, so the Fed, in my opinion, has notoriously done every accounting trick known to man to, to do their job, which is to um, um, counterfeit money while holding inflation stable. But in the, I'll give you another example. You know, right now the average new car in the United States is thirty-three thousand. Well, shit. When I got out of high school in nineteen eighty, the average new car was ten thousand. But you look at the Fed number; there hasn't been a three hundred percent increase in autos from nineteen eighty to twenty eighteen. But there has been a three hundred percent cooking of the numbers. So they massage the numbers. So, so I have so many friends. Um, that are doing what you're doing, and that they, they swear by it. Some of them are my classmates from UMKC Dental School, uh, Class 87, where they're just saying that this is the bomb. So, so what, what, what's, up, what's changed since the last time you came on the show? Yeah, and just to sort of emphasize, first, thanks for having me on the show, but just to emphasize your numbers, I'm not sure if you've seen uh, the recent report, but basically ADA showed that average dentist earnings have not changed since 1997. So that's over 20 years. Uh, so without all that inflation happening, the earnings have remained flat. And, and while where, the market where, where, where did you get that number? Or it, did, it was from the ADA. Did you have a uh, link to it or anything? I, yeah, I can send it to you after okay. the uh, yeah, broadcast. Send me the, link, send me the link, Howard, at dentaltown.com. And if you're listening to the show, send me an email. Tell me who you are, where you, uh, where you live, how old you are. Uh, I, li I like to know who my homies are. Okay. And uh, but anyway, so the and but by the way, the market itself, the dental market, has grown seventy percent in that time frame. So it's the market's growing, but dental is, dental earnings have remained flat, which is pretty amazing. I've never seen it in another market. Um, but so to come into your question about you know what have we been up to? So last time we were on, I was on it was back in I think the beginning of January, and we had just launched our uh, program, uh, Clear. 
And we had just gotten through our, what we were calling our pilot phase. And we had about 30, 40 dentists on the platform at the end of last year. And we were just basically testing the system, make sure it worked well. It provided the value uh, the dentists were looking for. And the pilot went very, very well. So we released it to the public to actually just as we were broadcasting in January. Uh, and since then, just to show you the sort of enthusiasm, we have over about 500 practices on the platform right now. Uh, so about 500 in a quarter. Uh, in basically 90 days. Uh, the feedback we're getting is very positive, both from the dentists and from the patients, by the way. So the patients love it. We just did a net promoter score uh, rating system into the, the uh, members, and they rated it above a nine out of a 10 point scale. Uh, and what they like about it is it's simple, it's easy to understand, it's affordable. Uh, there's no middleman, there's no complexity. So I just before I get to the dentist side, I just want to let everybody know the patients love the program. Uh, as much much as the uh, dentist. And then, then on the dentist side, what we're seeing is they are on average across the country right now charging over $300 for the subscription for the membership. And what that uh, gets the patient is their, you know, two cleanings a year, their exams, their, their x-rays, there's an emergency exam thrown in there. So, so everything the patient needs in order to, you know, keep up with their hygiene uh, twice a year. Um, and then in addition, the, the dentists are offering discounts off of their normal fees, you know, for fillings and crowns and so on. And those typical discounts range from about 15% up to 30% uh, off their sort of typical fees. Um, and again, it'll depend on which practice, you know, uh, you know, which, pra which practice you talk about, but it just, they, they all sort of customize it based on their needs. So, the, the feedback from the dentist, you know, they're keeping that subscription, right? That's not going to an insurer. Uh, so they keep that subscription uh, and then they just charge the patient directly for the fillings and the crowns. There's no paperwork. There's no pre-approvals. There's nothing uh, from a middleman hassle perspective. So what the dentists are getting is a nice profitable uh, patient. Uh, they're able to get rid of all the uh, overhead and the admin needed uh, to manage the plan. They're getting more satisfied uh, patients uh, and the net is we're seeing them increase revenue and profitability and it eventually, you know, as part of that, uh, building a subscription business, which is increasing the value of their practice. So that was a lot to throw in there. But that's that's what we've seen, you know, in a short time since we've launched the program. The millennials are burdened with about a tr one point three trillion dollars in student loans. Um, Thirty percent of them are living with their parents and they say another 50 percent would live with their parents. if They could, but their parents are divorced. There's no room, et cetera. And we're seeing the death of brands. Like when these millennials, when they when they go to Amazon and they see the big Duracell batteries and they're high price and they see these generic batteries. I mean, they're just buying generics all day long. And another heads up um, to you, Dennis, out there. Millennials, um, not only are they the biggest segment of the population now, they're also the biggest coupon clippers. They're using coupons more than my generation and, and the one before us ever. And um, so, so they shop on prices where I'm going with this. And uh, Delta Dental says 95% of the dentists take their insurance. And so that is a PPO. So you can say 95% of dentists uh, take PPOs. Uh, we think two thirds take three or more. Uh, and so when these price shoppers call the office, the dentist always quotes their, their, their cash fee. They'll say, well, how much is a crown? And they'll say, oh, $1,000. They'll say, thank you very much. And they hang up. And, and, and then I go and look at that dentist crown deals and 90% of his crowns are done with Delta, like 650 a crown. It's like, so why are you telling everyone on the phone a crown's a thousand when 95% of your crowns are 650? And then I, so that's a, the average reduction from fee to PPO is 42%. And you're saying your members are discounting somewhere between 15 to 30%. They don't have insurance. You want to build up cash patients, yet you say you want to build up cash patients, but you're giving them a, a your highest fee possible, a thousand dollars. So, so do you think um, do you think there's any benefit uh, towards more of fifteen percent versus a thirty percent? Because that's a hundred percent variance. Yeah, I think it, it just depends on the practice and what their philosophy is and what how they position themselves. Uh, so I was at the uh, the, the townie meeting uh, last week, and Chris Moriarty uh, had a great uh, presentation on uh, behavioral economics and how you price and position products to the patient. Uh, and, and by the way, he told me to tell you that he needs more time at the next townie meeting. <laughs> he looks like he wants two hours or three hours or so on for his presentation. presentation. <laughs> and, and he, and he got, did it just for the townie meeting. I mean, it was a whole new presentation. A great. And I just got to recommend everybody to go watch his stuff and talk to him. I mean, he, he knows uh, this whole area. But so the net is 
uh, page, or practices that position on value and uh, not just on price, we're actually seeing them towards the you know 10% or 15%. We actually have one practice that's given a 0% discount in their membership plan. Uh, and they're not positioning this as a you know way to get bargain procedures. It's a way to get great value uh, from the uh, from the practice. Uh, and then we have other practices on the other end of the scale who are more about trying to get volume and lots of patients, and they're willing to give uh, you know, lower, you know, take lower margins for the patient. So what I, I tell the practices is I think it can go either way. You can play either side of that spectrum, but know your patient base, know how you're branding your practice back to your patient base and into your, uh, your, your local market, and then price your membership plan accordingly. Uh, but it can, it can be applied across different, what I would consider brands and pricing strategies. So, so what, what, um, I, I feel like we're going way too uh, philosophical, and a lot of my homies <laughs> listeners might, might not even know what, what it is that you're doing. So can you back up a little bit and start with, A, how did you go from wearables uh, to in-house <laughs> dental insurance, and exactly what is your passion about? What, what is it, the details of what you're doing? Great. Uh, so I spent uh, about 10 years at Microsoft, then I left there and, and started a wearables device company. And what we did was we were creating wearables that made it real easy for uh, either a patient, like a heart patient, or a, uh, you know, any, uh, somebody with congestive heart failure and so on to monitor their body and do it in an easy way. So we created like a stick on, basically you could put it onto your chest and it would monitor your cardiovascular system. Uh, we also did the same product, but into the athletic space. And for people who are really trying to push their bodies and, and get a, uh, uh, you know, sort of the elite level uh, athlete and monitor their bodies, understand how it's recovering after exercise, how they can push or pull back day in and day out. And so what what that uh, became for me was it tied two of my key passions together. One is I love technology. The other is I love to help people understand themselves and improve their health. Um, so, you know, we sold that company back in March of 2016 and we actually sold it to a medical diagnostics company and I was looking for my next thing to do. And I ran into somebody who actually owned dental practices and, and I didn't know really anything about the dental uh, market besides I went every six months and got my cleanings, x-rays, exams and so on. But I started talking about the business side and he said it was really difficult uh, to, you know, make a living. It was very difficult from a profitability standpoint and attracting new patients and locking in existing patients. And he, he was basically blaming the insurers for a lot of it. Uh, and so I thought that was interesting. And he also said he knew about half of consumers in the U.S. never went to the dentist. They'll go to the dentist on an annual basis. And that made no sense to me. I just assumed people were going. And so I spent about nine months doing market research. Uh, and, and we looked at, we did uh, focus groups, we did interviews, we did a uh, national survey, both of patients without insurance and then also dentist. And what we learned on the dentist side was everything I had heard from that person was true. Um, and they were struggling to figure out how you sort of, you know, reposition the practices to, to make a profit and grow um, and, and get away from the dependence on insurance. And then on the patient side, what we heard loud and clear was they wanted more dental care. Uh, they also wanted a dental care plan, but they looked at insurance uh, and realized it's too it's too complex, it's too costly, and if their if their employer wasn't subsidizing, they weren't going to buy it on their own. So, you know, as I came out of that market research, I realized it tied back to my passion around one applying technology into the healthcare space and then improving and helping people get access to the care they want to improve their health. So that's where we sort of uh, created Clear from. Um, and then as far as Clear is concerned, what we've created is a platform that makes it very, very easy for a dentist to create their own, what we are calling membership plan and offer it directly to their patients and get rid of the middleman. So once a, a dentist will come on, on board, it takes about 15 minutes to set up a plan. We basically have a six step process they walk through, it's all online. They pick and choose the options, they set their subscription rates, they put in their, what they wanna, they create an office fee schedule. Uh, they can do things like exclude certain procedures. So if they don't offer orthodontics, they can exclude that. Uh, they can do things like chick, pick and choose between do they offer monthly payments versus annual payments or both, uh, and so on and so forth. There's lots of little options they can choose from, uh, but it's very easy to set up the plan. And once they set it up, they have access to a portal, and the portal basically enables them to invite patients into the plan. Uh, they can you know see what members have joined, you know what uh, care plans they've bought, 
uh, what uh, has been deposited, you know, of the payments made by the patient, what's been deposited into their bank account. And there's all kinds of things they can do, but it, it allows them to manage the, uh, the, the overall plan. And then on the uh, patient side, what we have is a whole nother application the patient uses. So they can be invited to the plan by the dental practice. We also give the dental practice uh, a little piece of code to put onto their website where a patient can click in and purchase the plan. Uh, but they can get access to the, the plan in multiple ways, but they can purchase, the patient can purchase the membership plan straight from any device, you know, their mobile phone, their tablet, uh, their PC. And we make that a very easy process. It's a very classic, you know, what a consumer would expect when they go to purchase something. Very simple, very nice UI three-step process, they purchase the plan and they and they move on. And then they, once they make the purchase, they have access to a portal as well where they can see the benefits that are part of their plan. Uh, they can, you know, add new members. So let's say they bought it for themselves. They want to add a spouse. They can add, add a, a new member to their plan. Uh, they can invite friends and family and get there's some incentives to do that. Uh, they can also print out like a membership card and plan documents. So that's everything they need. So we basically taken everything a dental practice needs to launch a plan, a membership plan, and basically made it very easy both for the dentist to implement and manage and for the patient to purchase and manage. Um, and so the, the net of all of that from a financial standpoint is the patient is paying a monthly or annual subscription. Um, so they can, if the dentist wants to, we, we collect the money all up front uh, if they want a, the patient to pay up front, or we collect it on a monthly basis if they allow monthly payments. Uh, that money is basically transferred to the dentist, dentist's bank account. Uh, you know, all electronically fast. We have a back end merchant bank uh, processing system that takes care of all that. And the net is the a, uh, the dentist needs to do very little uh, to manage the plan. It's it's all automatic and in, in the background. What, what what is the what is the business model called that like Netify and Spotify use, where they just ding your credit card every month or your life or your gym membership? What is that? Is that a it, is it, they, they usually call it a subscription business or subscription just a, market? What do you call? Re recurring sub subscription business model. Yep. Um, yep. So when they do a subscription, what, what percent sign up for the subscription the monthly? I mean, you, you, you earn your money uh, monthly, you pay your bills monthly. It's hard to do pay for a whole year up front. What, what percent go on the monthly subscription? So it's interesting. We assume that most are going to select the monthly option. So what, just to give you the practice side, 75% of our practices offer the monthly option but only 25% of patients actually select it. So 75% of the patients are paying on an annual basis upfront, which really surprises. And yeah, it changes by the, it's a, it, it changes by the demographic. So we looked at age groups and what they're doing. So about 80% of uh, 55 plus, anybody 55 plus, 80% of them pay upfront. They pay annual, about 20% of them select the monthly option. And then in the millennial space, almost 50% of millennials select uh, the monthly option because well, yeah, they're on a tighter budget. You, you said when they're 50 and above or 55 and above? 55 and above. Yeah, I, I'm 55 and it, I always thought it was crazy because um, dentists give uh, senior citizens a 10% discount. Shit, senior citizens are the only group that buys their houses and cars in cash. Their kids are gone. They, they've paid <laughs> off all their bills. And these are the people you give a discount. You should give the, the stay-at-home mom with four kids the discount. Absolutely. Not, not grandma and grandpa who will withdraw all the money they put into Social Security if it would have been invested in an S&P 500 index fund in three and a half years. Yep. And then they're going to go live the next 10, 15 years on borrowed money from their grandchildren. Uh, I think it's so funny when a, a grandparent comes and gives a newborn baby like a, a little gift. It's like, dude, you should give her the $60,000 of your debt <laughs> that she's going to have to pay off in her lifetime plus interest. So, so – um. Now, when they do the subscription revenue model, is that something that's terminated in 12 months or is that in perpetuity? So they sign up for a 12-month program. Uh, and when they do the monthly payment, by the way, we collect the first three months up front just to make sure they're serious and they're not trying to game the system. So the first three months comes up front and then the fourth month gets charged when the fourth month comes around. They, they, when they sign up, they sign up for an auto renewal function, just like Netflix and Amazon and the rest of them. So they basically say, yes, I'm going to renew after 12 months unless I take the action to, you know, uh, basically uncheck the auto renewal feature in the platform. Uh, and what we've learned is the consumer perspective, they're fine with that. They're used to that. They just want the ability to uncheck it if they decide not to renew it. And, but it makes renewal, when you think about it, a lot of uh, practices out there right now have manual uh, membership plans. And what we've heard from them over and over again is the renewal is 
really painful is they have to go back out. They have to call the customer, the patient. They got to talk to them. They got to resell them. They got to get their credit card again. And the renewal rates when they do manual membership plans is very, very low. We actually had one come into our platform. His, the renewal rate was 20 percent. So they're losing 80 percent of their uh, memberships uh, on an annual basis. So the auto renewal. Did, really you ever, did you ever talk to my office manager, Don? I know I know there were some emails after your last podcast, but did you ever call her? Well, I did not. No, we, we haven't connected. Well, will you will you send uh, Don uh, just celebrated her uh, 17th anniversary with me yesterday. And wow. uh, so I took her flowers and gave her a gift card. But uh, email her Don at today's dental dot com. Uh, Don D.A.W.N. at today's dental dot com and CC me Howard um, at uh, dentaltown.com and then and then also give, give her your phone number because uh you know she, i know she's swamped she's always busy uh but um we never we never got around uh to the final details on that and i want to see uh uh what, what what she thinks of all that um okay so um what percent of okay america's got 323 million people what percent of them do you think have dental insurance and what percent of them have to do cash? Yeah, so uh, the stats are about 60% of U.S. consumers have dental insurance and 40% do not. Of that 40% that do not have dental insurance, roughly 40 to 50% of them actually go to the dentist. So if you do the math, the typical practice, about 30%, 25 to 30% of the patients are coming in and paying cash. And it, it, it it's a cultural thing. There's, I mean, there's no dental insurance in South America. Uh, well, there's a new one in Brazil. We, by the way, we got that PDF. We got we got to do a podcast. Um, what's that? Well, yeah, it's it's the one uh, um, we need to. There's there's a new one starting in in Brazil, but like Asia, Africa, there, there's no dental insurance. And in fact, when you're in China, um, it really hurts the dentist brain to wrap his head around dental insurance. She's like, okay, so you eat chocolate and Coca-Cola and then your boss subsidizes your fillings and, and the government pays for it. They, they think it's reverse incentives. Like like the Chinese doctors have told me they, they think it's insane uh, that uh, insurance paid for by your employer and your government treats the lung cancer uh, that you got from smoking two packs yeah. a day for 40 years. I mean, they, they, they call it um, perverted incentives uh, moral hazards, uh, but when you're in the United States um, and and the Western world, so many people who pay 100% for their house and their car and their iPhone just have a mind block that you just can't pay for your own body. Someone else has to pay for your body. I'll, I'll pay for my Ford 150 and my ranch, but I ain't paying for my uh, 10 organ systems. I mean, that's, that's not my responsibility, <laughs> you know? So, um, um, but it is... Uh, so it's a psychological thing when they call your office and then you offer them insurance. And now that they have insurance, uh, now they feel like they, they can go. Yeah. And yeah, you're absolutely right. And I, I could actually argue that the U.S. system or U.S. country or whatever, the, uh, the U.S. does not have dental insurance, right? Because it's not really insurance. It just covers your cleanings, your exams and x-rays. You basically get discounts off of other you know, procedures at the end of the day when you net out what dental insurance really is. Well, well let, let's clarify that for the young kids because about 25% of the people sending me an email, Howard at dentaltown.com, are actually still in dental school. So insurance is an actuarial risk analysis versus the moral hazard of gaming the system. So everybody has fire insurance on their house in Ahwatukee. There's 85,000 people here. There's only been three houses that I, I'm aware of that burned down in my 30 years. So everybody pays a little, spreads the risk, three burned down. Same with car insurance. Everybody has car insurance pretty much, but how many yep. people do you know stacked their car last year? But in dentistry, there couldn't be any insurance because how do you spread the risk around when 100% need uh, cleanings, exams, and uh, x-rays, and a cleaning twice a year, and they all eat you know sugar, no one flosses. I mean, so there's no way to spread the risk around. So there's no such thing as dental insurance. There's only dental benefits. And in the United States, about 92% of those benefits are paid employer-based, and about 8% are paid uh, government-based, no federal level like um, uh, Medicare, uh, but it's at the state level, uh, Medicaid. Uh, so, yeah, it's only a dental benefit. I mean, you can get someone else to pay for it. So, what, so this is what would you call this then because uh, the gov your employer is not paying for this. 
The government's not paying for this. You're buying this. You're paying a set fee, three hundred a year, and you're getting your cleanings, exams, and X-rays free. And then the dentist is offering a fifteen to thirty percent discount. So what do you call it? A discount plan? A discount? I I, I don't like to call it discount plan because there's discount plans out there, and they act just like insurance, right? So they negotiate fees with the dentist, or they don't even negotiate. They tell the dentist what fees are going to accept, and it could be a thirty-nine dollar cleaning that you have to accept from a discount dental plan. And also, discount dental plans take a fee up front from the patient. So they'll take, let's say, $99 all the way up to $199 in order for a patient to join. Well, the discount dental plan keeps that, right? We're way different than that. And that, that subscription goes to the dentist, right? We don't keep that. I uh, so I just like to think of it as a dental care plan that you offer directly to your patients. A dental it's, care plan. Now, is it yeah. technically illegal to call this dental insurance? It, it is. I guess officially it's illegal. So we actually went through a full legal review. And one thing we have to do is state very clearly to the patient that this is not insurance. And we say that in every you know thing that they get on and read, it says this is not insurance. And now let me, this is where I go a little bit nuts on, you know, I get it. And there's the laws and you got to sort of, you know, you know, you know, whatever, you know, uh, meet the laws, but Insurance, dental insurance, quote unquote, is not insurance either. Uh, so think about this for a second, right? What other insurance? You mentioned home and auto and so on. If the the so what dental insurance does is it covers your cleanings, your X-rays, your exams, and then you basically get a discount if you need major treatment or minor treatment, like a filling, right? You still pay in most of these plans fifty percent of that fee, or for a crown, you pay you know whatever the number might be, maybe sixty percent, and they all change and they're different. But it's not covering your catastrophic, you know, issues. It covers your needs day in and day out, which is your cleaning. So it would be the equivalent of getting car insurance that covers your gas, right? Or covers your wiper blades, uh, the sort of the standard maintenance. It doesn't make any sense. In a way, dental insurance is saying, I have a quote unquote catastrophic issue every six months, which is a cleaning that the insurance is gonna cover. Uh, so what that's done though, is when you think about what your benefits you actually get out of these plans is your cleanings, your x-rays, exams, and discounts, lots of other things. But you got this huge middleman in the way Who's creating an amazing amount of you know paperwork and hassle and denying claims? I you know the average about twenty percent of all claims are denied. Uh, they keep the premium, right? They don't pass that on to the dentist. Uh, if the patient happens to come in, then the dentist might get paid, but they get paid at a very discounted rate, like you mentioned, forty some percent discount to their normal rate. So it, we have this whole complexity in the middle between the dentist and the patient that is not needed. There's no insurance, right? And they're all capped. So they cap your benefit at a thousand dollars or fifteen hundred. So just think if your your you know your you know uh, home insurance cap your you know the value of your home at ten thousand dollars, right? I mean it doesn't make any sense, and they never changed it over twenty or thirty years. Um, so what we end up having, in my opinion, is we have a system that just doesn't work. It doesn't work for the dentist or for the patient, and it's not what it says it is. It's not insurance. Uh, it's it's just cleanings and uh, and some discounts. And, and that's why I was so disappointed with Obamacare because um, it, um, you know, I love the the good stuff from the heart, like no pre-existing conditions. You know, if your kid lives a, lives, you know, you can cover your kids on your own insurance to like twenty six. I loved all that big heart stuff, but but typical government, um, they they never ever try to figure out how to cut costs. And every expert I've ever read says that thirty percent of our health care cost is just shuffling paper. Yes. Absolutely. And, and, and look at Delta Dental. I mean, I mean, Steve Jobs came out with a smartphone in 2007. You would think Delta would have a damn app on their phone. And when they come in, I just pull up my app and a scanner Thanks. and it updates all my information, all my plan, all by. But no, I have to have yeah. a freaking human call your human at the dental insurance company and sit on hold and listen to elevator music for 30 minutes and then and then they wonder why you know i mean they've never they're, they're lowering our uh, our prices but they're not lowering our overhead and and it's crazy i, I mean if you would have just taken half the paper out of the healthcare system the, the cost would have gone down 15 percent but what he did is that it got rid of no pre-existing conditions uh Great, love it, but the cost just went out of control, and it, um, you know, it's so. So, my, Howard, I mean, this is it drives me. You, you have the same passion I have around it. I mean, so we did a study of insurers. They keep about forty percent of all payments made by either the employer or the patient. So think about that: forty percent goes to them. Medical and or the, dental? Dental. So dental. dental so, insurance companies are keeping forty percent. 
so forty percent gro- gross revenue. Yep. Uh, anything that it, so the patient pays, you know, let's say the employer is paying half the premium, uh, and then the you know the employees pays the other half or whatever the split is. You know, that obviously all goes to the insurer, right? And then the patient themselves, about thirty three percent of patients with insurance never go to the dentist. So thirty three percent is it? All, so they keep all of that premium for they don't deliver anything. Um, and then on average, people with dental benefits come into the dentist one time a year. So when you think about the employer and the uh, employee paid for two, right, into the insurance, they only came in once. So the dentist gets one cleaning exam x-ray and maybe some other treatment they provide at that point. But that other half that was paid into the insurer for the next visit stays with the insurer. That never gets to the dentist. So if you do all the math, and by the way, and I can send you a link to this, the uh, California Dental Association did a study of something called dentist loss ratio. And there's a thing in medical called medical loss ratio. The medical loss ratio is a way for the government to control how much of medical insurance goes to care. And typically what that metric is set at is anywhere between 80 and 90% of anything you put into a medical insurance plan needs to go to care. If it doesn't go to care, then the insurance company has to refund that money back to the whoever paid the premium. Dentist, the dental insurance doesn't have that. But California actually did a study. They collected what they called the dentist loss ratio, dental loss ratio for dental insurance. They, they forced the dental insurance companies to actually report back to the association. Uh, and what they found was the, the range of funds getting to dental care varied from about, about 40% up to about 60% of actual money paid into the dental insurance actually went to care. They actually had a plan. They found one plan where 5% went to dental care. Now they're not giving the names of the different groups that, you know, what the percentage is by insurer, but it was pretty amazing. It actually validated our market research. So if you average all that, it says about 50% of money paid into dental insurance goes to care. You know, um, and, and again, not only has uh, Delta not done one thing with a smartphone, you know, it's really gross. Um, last week, did you hear about 911? No. They just added the texting capability to 911. It's like, are you shitting me? <laughs> I mean, I've called 911 a, a few times over the last 10, 20 years, you know, car wreck or something, and they're saying, well, can you give me a description of the car? It's like, dude, I can FaceTime my 80 year old mother. Why can't I just FaceTime you and show you the damn car? Why am I describing it? And then if your house is broken in, and, and you heard robbers downstairs. Wouldn't you rather just be texting 911 than calling and having a ringtone and noise and all that and not being able to listen to what's going on? I mean, right. the government is so incompetent. And, and then they wonder why they've had an 11% approval rating for two decades. It's because, yeah, they're spending all their time arguing back and forth and, you know, tweeting about things versus. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the only secret to lower prices is lower costs. And you got to it's a four finger rule, you know, on every person that pitches me a dental idea. I always say, is it faster? Is it easier? Is it higher in quality? And is it lower in cost? And yep. they and, and sometimes they, they only get one of those right. And, uh, you <laughs> that, know, that, and. and and, and Sorry, Dr. Helped. Christensen showed that in his presentation at the townie meeting. He had that slide. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, they, they taught us that in MBA school um, back in 1998. I mean, it's the four finger rule. Um, it's just got to it's got to do those things. Um, so then, how do you get paid? How, how so, do you make money? So we basically just take a, a piece of that subscription that's paid into the dentist. So what what happens when you when a dental practice sets themselves up on our platform? We actually create a merchant bank account for them. And that merchant bank account is with a company called Stripe, and you can look them up there. They do like they do the back end of Amazon, and I think they're eBay, and there are a number of other technology companies use them. Very, they've actually got very large, but they're an electronic merchant bank. Um, we set up a merchant bank account for the dentist. When a uh, patient makes a purchase, the money goes into that merchant bank account. It takes about 24 hours for it to clear, and then it's transferred electronically over to the dentist's bank account, whatever dental, you know, whatever practice account they want it sent to. We take a fee from that subscription and it averages, I won't get into all the details, it averages about $4 per patient per month on the platform. So we don't get paid unless the dentist gets paid and that subscription is active and uh, and being paid. 
So what are my homies going to find if they go to your website, clear.com? By, by the way, explain the name. It's K-L-E-E-R, K-L-E-E-R, but it sounds like clear, C-L-E-A-R. Uh, what, what is clear? Where did that come from? So clear came actually from our market research. So what we heard both from the dentist side and the patient side was things are just too complicated, com too complex, too many hassles. Uh, and when you think about insurance, lots of exclusions and, you know, uh, things like you can't, you know, the cap and you can only get so many, so much treatment over a certain period of time. And so we just said, you know what, the major uh, thing here is making it very clear uh, what is being offered by the dentist and what the patient is signing up for. So just get rid of all the mess, all the hassle and the uh, how opaque it is. Uh, it also had to do with pricing as well. So one of the things that came back from the market research is patients were uh, typically overestimating dental costs by two to four times. So if we asked them how much a cleaning is, they would range, the response would range from $100 to $500. We had, uh, you know, patients actually quoting crowns at $4,000. And it was very consistent. They were way overestimating the cost. And so price transparency is a really important thing to the consumer. And actually, it's a very positive thing for the dentist. A lot of dentists don't want to show pricing to the patient. Actually, my, I encourage them to do it because 80% of the time, they're going to actually realize it's less than what they expected it to be. So Clear actually has to do also with price transparency on the platform. Have you, uh, you have three kids? I do. Yeah. Well, I, I, you, you might know the answer to this question because maybe you've uh, already had a vasectomy. Uh, I, uh, um, that's the only surgery I've had. Um, how much do you think, have you had a vasectomy? I, a while ago. <laughs> well, so do you remember the fee? How, how much was my vasectomy? Yeah, I can't, I can't even guess. I'm $500. That's exactly what it was. But when you <laughs> ask a woman that at a dental convention who does financial arrangements to make your point that the patient over guesstimates the price two to four times, I say, how much was my vasectomy? And they'll be like six women in the front row. And the, and the entry price will be two grand. And one of, one of the women will go all the way up to like eight grand. So, and, and one time, um, and one thing that's really blown my mind is one time uh, we were at the Suns game, there's four dentists, and we drank too much, and I was trying to make a point. So we walked around the, our aisle all the way around the Sun Stadium, back to our seats, asking Aaron person. We said, hey, we're dentists. We're just curious if you know, pointed to my front two, number eight, said, how much do you think a root canal cost on your very front tooth? The lowest price was 2000 yeah. And they were routinely saying five, six, seven, eight. And, and then I was telling these dentists, I said, what's even more strange is that in every zip code, you know, say the dentist, uh, uh, say they charge a thousand for a molar, uh, but their uh, Delta is only paying them, you know, 650 or 700, but they're next door to a endodontist. And the endodontist is charging 1500 for a root canal. And of course, all the insurance companies uh, will pay the specialists far more money, which is why you're seeing the business model changing these DSOs. Uh, they really need to have the general dentist just do general dentistry because they make so much more money having specialists rotate through the DSOs because if the general dentist does the root canal, they might only get 650 from an insurance company, but if they have a specialist come in and do it, they might be able to bill 1250 for it, which is another thing insurance is just throwing us under a bus because when we go to court or we go to the, the state board of dental examiners and, and, and your root canal's four millimeters short, the endodontist grades it and says, that is not acceptable. And you can't say, well, dude, you got $1,200. So you had the money to keep drilling all the way down the bottom. But I, I was drilling for oil and ran out of cash and stopped five <laughs> millimeters short of the apex. Uh, so how does, it, it, imagine cars. Imagine insurance only gives you, me 10000 for a car, but they give the specialist 20000 mm -hmm. for a car. And then they're comparing my Ford Escort to the specialist Ford Taurus. But when you get to court or the board, there's no market differentiation based on price. It's just standard of care, which, by the way, every single malpractice attorney I've ever podcasted 
give us a slightly different version of what even is standard of care. I, I don't think I don't think anybody really knows what it is, but I'll tell you the bottom line what it is, is when you go to court, the specialists are gonna grade your work and they're getting paid 30% more revenue to do that damn same work. So they can have all the latest, greatest equipment, they can buy, you know, more and more training. They only do one thing and you have to compete with that. So the game, the game just seems to be digressing, and I and I like what you're doing. You're you're trying to uh, uh, take back some ground. By by yeah. the way, on your clear.com, uh, your Facebook um, link works, uh, your YouTube link works, uh, your Instagram works, but your Twitter link does not work. So I take that back. It just it just came on uh, the first time it didn't connect. The president of the United States. I, I mean <laughs> I mean CNN prime time. It's only a million viewers out of uh now you can't say that's a million people because it's a million homes right uh and and then fox news is three billion well trump bypassed all of that because he had five million twitter followers and that grew to 10 20 30 40 50 so he could he could send a tweet so on facebook when you make a post it doesn't go to all your followers unless you boost the post for money but when you yeah. make a post on twitter Instagram or LinkedIn, it goes to all your followers instantly. So the only secret to lower prices is lower costs. So if you want to lower your social media costs, you get in bed with Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn because all of Facebook is pay to play. And that's also the reverse of who do you invest in. I've never given Twitter or uh, um, LinkedIn or Pinterest a dollar. So I sure as hell wouldn't buy their stock. Uh, but you've given Facebook a lot of money, and that stock's done really, really well. Um, yeah. did, 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 Until did, recently, did, right? <laughs> well, well, do you, do you, um, I, I don't know. I, I always like to um, listen to people. And when I was at Townie meeting, I was asking, you know, not just dentists, but staff, all this stuff. And you know what the consensus is about all that stuff? That they, they assumed 10 years ago that transparency was dead. They already yeah. knew that now everybody has your name, your birthday. I mean, shit, you put your birthday on Facebook and 20 people tell you happy birthday on your birthday. I mean, they just and, – and, and I said, well, what do you think about that? And you know what dentists were telling me? They say, well, you know what? I When I'm doing a Google search, um, if they have my history, they, they know what I'm looking for. It's better searches. And if they take my data and serve me up an ad because they know that I'm – say you're an avid elk hunter and you're always watching elk hunting videos on YouTube and there's some really cool ad about some new elk urine – spray you can spray all over you know they they so the bottom line is i i think um i i don't think there's going to be any pushback from facebook because it's, privacy uh, died years ago yeah i i agree i th I, th I agree I, I people are sort of uh, complacent to it and don't worry about it uh, but the issue i have with those business models and uh facebook is just one example of many i think google is similar but is they have to make it much easier for somebody to understand what they're doing with that data and opt out and then change the services based on that. What I really don't like about those services right now, and this, by the way, long term, you know, will hurt them severely. It's if, if you look in a lot of different markets, if you don't be, if you're not honest and open and give people ability to control what's happening to them, eventually somebody comes along and does that and you know upends your business model. Uh, so I was surprised. I watched some of the Zuckerberg uh, testimonial. I was shocked at how much he didn't know about what's happening with the data. He couldn't even explain where your data was going and who was using it. Uh, and here was one example that really scared me is one of the explanations was if, if I'm, I never used Facebook before, but I'm in the contact list of somebody who is using Facebook and they add me to Facebook, Facebook now advertises to me. <laughs> So think about that, right? Now they've opened up the net to include people who opted out of Facebook. Now I'm in their database. And there should be some some regulation around that, that if somebody hasn't opted in to be part of your platform, you shouldn't be able to store their data and use it uh, as you wish. So that was a big issue for me is how opaque it is. And even they don't understand, their CEO doesn't understand where the data is going. Uh, did you know his dad was a dentist? I did, yes. Yeah, was, and... Uh... I, I think his dad and his mom, I mean, his mom's a, uh, an MD, he, his dad's a dentist. I mean, they're just the greatest people. So I, I think the guy, I mean, he comes from an amazing family. So I, I assume he's a, a really, really good guy. Yeah. His dad tells me he's a really good guy. But what I always think, what I always feel sorry for Ed about is uh, I got four boys. His, uh, Mark's only 33 years old. 
Could you imagine sitting there watching your 33 year old son getting grilled by Congress? And, oh, no. I, mean, I mean, talk about, I mean, I bet Zuckerberg's heart is worse than mine at 55. I bet, I bet he's eaten more stress in the last 10 years. I bet when his alarm clock goes off in the morning, he just wants to throw it through the window and go back to bed. I mean, that is a, my God. Well, he, he, he showed amazing restraint in those hearings because the, uh, they were asking him questions like, I mean, the one question I thought was really funny was they were going down the line of questioning of email. He, they were asking about email being used on WhatsApp. There is no email on WhatsApp, right? It's just a messaging system. And he was constraining himself. Mark was constraining himself from he could have easily tore that person down. And he let them continue with their, their discussion. And he answered in a very polite way. But I was like, the people asking the questions don't even understand what's the what the products do. Uh, and that's what frustrates me. As a parent, if my child was up there, I'd want to just tear into the people asking the questions. I'd say, ask your question if you know what you're talking about. If you don't know what you're talking about, get somebody else, right? Don't ask it act, acting like you know what you're talking about. Yeah, the other thing I think is adoring about uh, Mark Zuckerberg is, you know, his uh, dad's a dentist who married an MD, and he married an MD. I yep. mean, his <laughs> wife Priscilla is an MD. He met her at Harvard, but uh, I just think that's... <laughs> So yeah, he's just in the fast lane. I just retweeted your last tweet. Your uh, your Twitter is um, is uh, at clear underscore LLC. So at clear K L E E R underscore LLC. I just retweeted your last tweet to my twenty five thousand homies. Thank you so much for following me on Twitter, um, and thanks so much for um, uh, following me on uh, subscribing on YouTube. On YouTube or YouTube.com forward slash Dental Town Magazine. But I just retweeted your last uh, tweet. Clear comes with full version control that makes it easy to edit your membership plan and track changes, design your plan at, and then there's the link. And the reason I'm telling this is because they're driving the car. 85% of the people listening right now are driving to work, so they can't take notes. Okay. Uh, and by the way, we, we always make a transcript of this, so where it's posted on Dental Towns, because some people say um, they can uh, read a one-hour podcast in 20 minutes. Uh, but mm -hmm. they have to listen to it. In fact, a lot of people are telling me they always listen to this at 1.5. So right now, you and I probably sound like Mickey Mouse. Uh, then the other one is uh, with Clear, you can completely customize your membership plan. It's your plan after all. Design your plan. But my next question is, um, uh, is this available on an app? Do you use any app technology uh, on the smartphone? So we actually have an app in development, but so far it hasn't been needed because we actually created the whole application to be mobile friendly. So you can pull up the app and it works just like a mobile app. You just don't have to download it. Um, so once you join, you get a link to the portal and you can you can manage and use that from uh, from any phone, any tablet, any PC. It, 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 uh, it's a dynamic app that, that uh, scales to whatever device you're using. Well, you know, explain that because um we it took us a year, and uh, we did it last year, making Dental Town uh, mobile friendly uh, yeah. for the deal. And when you go to any of your homies' websites in dentistry, their app ain't mobile friendly. In fact, I can't believe how many of them still have flash images. So it's just like a black hole on an iPhone. Uh, but it, but explain mobile friendly and why a dentist should do that uh, for their own dental website. Yeah, so to answer the question of why they should do it, about 80% of all traffic is going to come through mobile devices. So if you haven't optimized your app or your website for mobile, you're missing the, the majority of the market. Um, it's actually very easy to do. There's some investment up front, but there's now technologies out there that you used to, in the past, you used to have to develop different applications for different use cases. So one app for a PC another app for a mobile device and so on, and they weren't compatible. Uh, and so you doubled the value, you know, the, the price of your app development. Now there's technologies out there that are dynamic. So they understand what device they're being viewed on and they change their behavior based on that. So we have, we're a great example. We have one application and you can, you know, if somebody wants to you know, try this, they can pull up our website, uh, clear.com, K-L-E-E-R.com. They can pull it up on a PC, pull it up on a tablet and pull it up on a, uh, mobile device, uh, their phone, and you'll see it scales to that uh, to that device, and you get a good experience on the device you're using. It's one set of code, so you don't have to you don't do multiple coding. You do one coding, and then it, like I said, it uh, it scales to whatever device it's on.
Mo- mo- mobile's taking over everything. I mean, it's uh, it's just amazing. When when I was in uh, high school, it was IBM and mainframes. Even when I got out of dental school in '87, I mean, whenever you heard a conversation about a computer, it was IBM. And then about uh, about '85, uh, the microcomputer came out. So Bill Gates wrote the software for the microcomputer, called it Microsoft. And then it was that PC revolution. And that thing is uh, contracted. I can't even believe Dell's no longer even listed. I mean, that was like mm-hmm. one of the biggest uh, stocks from 94 to March of 2000. It was Dell, Cisco, Microsoft, uh, um, Intel, and now it's just, you listen, and it's all smartphone. But I think what's also interesting about a smartphone, tell you how much money dentists have, is you can buy IP address. Like when you log on to Dental Town, we, we know if you're on an iPhone or an Android. Yeah. And um, when you go above a city, they have uh, aerial data maps wherever, like like you look above L.A., Beverly Hills, all iPhone. Uh, then the poor areas are all Android. And New York, uh, you know, Ma- lower Manhattan, all iPhone. And then uh, upper Manhattan, all Android. And uh, dentists are pretty much, uh, have, have, uh, they're, they're pretty much all iPhone. Uh, so they, yep. must, they must be doing well. Yeah, we we uh, we see in our traffic as well. It's about eighty five percent our iPhone and about fifty percent our Android. And then I um, say, say the numbers again. It, it's about eighty five percent our iPhone from the uh, practice on the practice side, and about fifteen yeah. percent or something else on the patient side. It's about fifty fifty. Um, and the just real quick on the platform itself, um, we're, we were surprised. We thought about, we were thinking 75% of patients would go to the front desk of the dentist and buy the membership plan. And so there's an app, there's a little link inside the, the patient or the dentist portal where the front desk can add a patient and, you know, and basically do the purchase process for the patient. And so we were expecting about 75% of patients to come through that way. What actually happened is 75% of patients are buying off of their mobile device which is great. So they're very used to the front desk sends them a link, they hit the link and they purchase it on their own. Or some practices actually have tablets in their office and they just hand a tablet to the patient and the patient makes the purchase on their own. Um, Or they go up to the website of the practice and there's a link there to buy the plan. Um, What's great about that is it takes that burden away from the front desk. Uh, They don't have to enter those patients. But to your point, what really surprises us is that's actually what the patients prefer. They actually, we talked to them and they basically said, you know, if I'm buying something, I'd like to keep it private. I'm used to doing it on my phone, right? I have no issue with that. Uh, and they just follow through and, and get it done on their own. So it's been a, that's the power of the mobile device is you can actually offload some admin uh, to, to your consumers. Well, um, an, another, uh, another thing that's uh, frightening to me is, um, you know, all these DSOs cannot go public because a all they're doing is a roll up. They'll go get a hundred million dollar line of credit, and then they'll go buy a hundred offices doing a million dollars a piece. They go, look, man, we went from zero to a hundred million in sales. It's like, yeah, you also have a hundred million dollars in debt, and then yep. you come back ten years later. Now they're two hundred million in debt at two hundred million sales. So there's only three publicly traded dental offices that are actually profitable. And none of them have a hygiene department. It's one three hundred smiles and Pacific Smiles in Australia and Q and M in Singapore. And I've done podcasts with all three of those owners. They said, I don't know how these American dentists do it. I mean, how do you pay a hygienist forty dollars to do a fifty five dollar cleaning when the ADA says your average overhead is sixty five percent? But you say on your website that your membership plan can turn your hygiene department into a profitable subscription business. How is that so? Yeah. So yeah, the, the membership plan has a number of you know, effects on the practice itself. So the, the first, and I'll just go through these, some of these numbers and then get to that profitable subscription business. So uh, by charging on average on our platforms about $324 for, for a subscription. So for that $324, you're given two cleanings, two exams, two x-rays, uh, and an emergency exam. That's profitable business, right? That's a good profitable business, much more so than insurance plan or discount uh, dental plan. So in addition to that, so when a member signs up, they come in, typical uninsured patient comes in once every two years. That's an average across the U.S. When they sign up for a membership plan, they come in about 1.4 times a year on average. So they increase their um, their visitation by about 3x. So what you end up having is these members are coming in, right? They're getting their hygiene done, which is great. They're keeping that hygiene department moving and, and active. Uh, and they also, that, that subscription is profitable for the practice. But when they're in the chair, 
a member, somebody part of a membership plan will accept about 50 to 75 percent more treatment in addition to that hygiene when they're in that chair in a membership plan versus they're uninsured and paying cash. And the reason is what we call the membership club effect. So, you know, I paid in. Right. I'm committed to this. I'm sort of on the other side of the rope. I know I get discounts on my other care. So I trust the practice more than if I'm an uninsured patient paying cash. And they're much easier. And this is not just true in the dental space, by the way. It's true across all industries. When you pay a subscription, you typically will purchase anywhere between two and four times more than somebody who's not paying into the subscription model. So it doubles, you know, when you think about it, it's a, it's a double effect. One, you get that subscription, you create a profitable, you know, hygiene department, you get more treatment acceptance, right? You drive more revenue. The, the value of the practice, you know, from a, a profitability practice increases. And then one more kicker on top of that is, when investors buy businesses, they will pay two to five times more for a subscription business over a non-subscription business, right? Because it takes the risk out of the cash flow of the business. So we actually can show a practice, if they're able to sign, let's say they have 30% of their patients that are uninsured, let's say I can magically flip the switch and all 30% of those patients are now paying into a membership plan and paying that subscription and coming in and getting that treatment and additionally you know, and, and accepting more treatment, you would double the value of your practice fairly easily by just doing that, not adding one new patient, just bringing these uninsured patients in, making a membership plan, having them come in for the visitations, having them accept treatment and, and paying that subscription. That would double the value of your practice. Uh, well, you know, on a large scale, the richest man in the world, Jeff Bezos, uh, he says his Amazon Prime members uh, buy twice as much stuff as yep. their non-Prime members. Um, it, it's why uh, everybody thought uh, sole price uh, with Price Club was insane when he started his deal. Mm -hmm. He said, "No, no, not anyone can just come shop here. You got to buy a membership, and he's going to make it a hundred bucks because he didn't want all he didn't want all the uh, the crazies coming in yep. uh, to buy one gallon of milk and and one box of cereal. It's like I, I don't even want that market. I, I it's want a perfect people, example. Yeah, so I want to be like going to come in and get a big old cart and buy four hundred dollars worth of stuff." Yeah, and, and Howard, that's what we tell the practices. Like, don't give these free, you know, initial visitations. I mean, it's fine if you want to try to get some interest in from some other, you know, whatever, some people. But you, what you're going to do is you're going to find the, the bargain hunters who are going to flip practices, right, at, at a drop of a dime. Invest in a membership plan. You know, actually use it in a way as a filter for those who aren't going to commit to your practice. And what you're going to find is these these patients that come in and buy the membership plan are the committed patients. And they're the ones who want to, you know, basically get more treatment. They want to be part of the practice. They want to feel like they're being treated well. Um, and it's a good way to, you know, create long-term value. We're not after short-term value. We're not trying to flip a patient or try to get, you know, a patient to come in and do one treatment and leave. We're trying to get them committed over many years uh, to, to, your, to your practice. And, you know, I called it here first on uh, the Dentistry and Sensor podcast a thousand days ago. That, that Groupon it was a race to the bottom. Th those people aren't loyal. Absolutely. Um, you, the, you get a Groupon deal and it says, oh, you go to the, this Mexican restaurant, you get all this stuff half off, and then they get the next coupon to go to the next Mexican restaurant. You know, they're just going from a, a Macayos to Arriba. They're, they're, they're not loyal. It's a race to the bottom. And the thing that yep. um, I'm trying to get dentists to uh, – Quit talking about it. They talk about the new patient experience. No, you should talk about everyone's patient experience. And they're always trying to get new patients. But the mature Fortune 500, they're all into loyalty programs. Absolutely. Uh, uh, Chase, Chase, credit card, Southwest Airlines. Everybody who's the real deal, like Costco and Sam's Club and Price Club, is trying to get you on a membership plan. And they're trying to keep customers for life. And the dentist is trying to burn and churn new patients. And you say to this dentist, dude, you're in a town of 5,000. You, you got here when you're 25. Now you're 65. 40 years later, you still need new patients? That's dude, crazy. you've gone through everyone in the county three times. Have you ever focused on quit burning and churning? I mean, if a hygienist works 40 hours a week, 50 weeks a year, that's 2,000 hours a year. That means she can see 1,000 people for a cleaning exam twice a year. So, you, so the average new dentist is getting 25 new patients a month. That'd be, that'd be adding a hygienist every three and a half years. But that dentist has been practicing there from age 25 to 65. He only has one hygienist the whole time. So if his hygiene capacity is not expanded, it's like, it's like a cup of coffee. Could you imagine just standing there for 40 years pouring coffee <laughs> into the same damn cup? You know every molecule going in is coming out running down the side. And I can't find a single dentist 
who does not accept new patients because it's it's a hard job to keep. I mean, you're not selling them, you know, chips and salsa and a couple of cheese enchiladas. I mean, you're giving them a shot. You're hurting them. You're drilling them. They might not like the way it feels. They might not like the way uh, it looks. They they might, and it's not just you. They might not like you, your assistant, your hygienist, receptionist. There's so many emotional touch points. Plus, my dad uh, owned a Sonic Drive-In. My God, everybody that ever went to Sonic Drive-In, you couldn't beat the smile off their face with a crowbar. They were about to eat a cheeseburger, a chili hot dog, onion rings, tater tots. I mean, I, I don't care if the what happened. They're just so happy. And then you go, uh, same, same townie meeting. Uh, I was a townie meeting, took my granddaughter to Magic Kingdom. I mean, everybody's so happy at Magic Kingdom <laughs> and Sonic Drive-In. And then... Why did we pick dentistry? They're all scared. They're all frightened. They're going to get a shot. They think it's going to cost two to four times more than it really is. And you need to switch from new patient marketing and the new patient experience to the overall total patient um, reality experience. And you need to start doing membership programs and loyalty programs. I can't believe we were already past the hour. Hell, we're a... Uh, way past the hour, but would you consider this a loyalty program? It is exactly what it is. That's exactly what it is. It's a loyalty program. It's it's a, it's basically inviting the patient into your practice and giving them, you know, sort of what I consider extra care. And you actually have them sort of as a lifetime, I, I look at it as a lifetime member of your practice. So there is a piece of this, which is all the economic side and the procedure side, but there's another piece of this, which is these are gonna be your best patients. These are the ones you want to treat really well. We see this over time. We add things to this in, outside of just the procedures, right? They should be getting things like gifts from time to time, right? They should be getting extra treatment when they come in. People should be treating them as special. I mean, when you think about airlines, when you walk up to that, you know, to get on, on board, they have one line for their loyal, you know, you know, flyers, and they have another line <laughs> for their non-loyal flyers. And I'm not saying we get that harsh about it, but – the loyal patients should feel better, right, about their experience, and they should feel you care. It should be a flag in your system to say, and this person's committed to a subscription, right? These are the people we want to keep. And by the way, Howard, you said this, but there is not an – I can't find another industry that doesn't do this, that this is like something that you, your current patients are by far the most valuable thing you have. They're by far your most valuable asset, and, it, and especially the uninsured because they're willing to pay more than you're, you're insured and you don't have all the hassle, right? The paperwork, the, treat them like gold. Even if you don't do a membership plan, treat your uninsured and your cash paying customers as gold, do something extra for them, make them feel good. Uh, versus trying to go find a new patient that you know nothing about, right? You're gonna spend $500 trying to find that patient. And by the way, most of them come in and leave within a year. Uh, so stop throwing money into that hole. I'm not saying that don't do it. You want to do it. You want to be smart about it. There's ways to do that that you know are more efficient. Uh, but you have something right in front of you that's incredibly valuable and could be worth two times what it currently is, which is your existing patients, including your dormant patients, by the way. Most of those dormant patients are staying away because they're fear cost. And so a membership plan, by the way, is a good way to get them back into the uh, into the practice and active. But it's amazing to me that you know the the, the market, the dentist market, hasn't you know really focused on that and made that the number one priority to grow revenue. Yeah, and I'll just end on this note. Um, you know, for 30 years, you know, I'll point to a patient's, uh, maybe it's their only crown, maybe it's the only tooth of the root canal, and I'll say, you know, when did you have this root canal done? Who did it? Was it here in Phoenix, back in Iowa? They never remember. <laughs> like, are, are you kidding me? Someone got in your mouth and did a freaking root canal, and you don't even know who it was, when it was. <laughs> they never remember anything technical. They only remember... Uh, if they liked you, how you made them feel. And, um, and, and you know, the Blockbuster and the ATM machine are two classic business examples. Blockbuster had limited hours, and it was replaced by Redbox. But, but you know what the customer experience different was? Nothing. There was no downgrade in the customer experience of going to Blockbuster or a box. And yep. that's what your team is doing. That's what your introvert receptionist, hygienist, assistant, or dentist are doing. There's no difference between going into the bank teller or an atm machine you're you're just you're just you're not connecting with them you're not making them secrete dopamine oxytocin uh serotonin and um you know in in uh every major business the highest paid department is whoever answers the phone inbound sales whoever calls out outbound sales and you know that dentist will get a cancellation and you know what he'll do 
he'll go back in the office and surf Facebook for an hour <laughs> instead of going up front, sitting down on Dentrix, EagleSoft, Open Dental, and say, "Give me, give me, give me, uh, give me a printout names and numbers who uh, fell off the recall system are coming in." Hey, Dave Monahan, it's Howard Foran. I'm your dentist. Uh, um, my God, you didn't you didn't even come in this year. What what's going on, buddy? Because last time you were in, you know, you had you had mild. Uh, to moderate uh, gum, you know, periodontal disease, gingivitis. I don't want it to turn into something major. Um, you know, what, what's going on? Did, did, did you did you move? Did you, you know, what, what's going on? You're like, oh, man, I know. But your dentist is calling you, showing concern. But see, the dentist is above outbound sales. <laughs> like, well, I'm not a salesman. I'm a dentist. Well, that's what your hygienist says. Yeah, and the, and yeah. she's back there with a cancellation back there eating donuts for an hour. And, and, then, and then your front office receptionist, when they answer the phone, it sounds like a librarian. Yeah. And, and you, you just got to connect. And uh, inbound sales, the most important person in that office is receptionist. Outbound sales, what I like to do before I go home or go on to lunch or whatever, I'll go up there and say, uh, you need me to call anybody? And my Valerie might say, you know what? I talked to Dave Monahan for like 30 minutes, and, and he didn't schedule. And I, I'm not even sure. I'm not even sure why, why why I lost him. You know what I mean? So I'll call yeah. back and go, Dave, hey, getting ready to go to lunch. Just talk to Valerie. She said she talked to you this morning for about 20 minutes, but she feels like uh, you still had more questions, and she she thought it was best that I actually talked to you. So what's going on, buddy? Yeah. And they're like, shit, now the doctor's on the phone. And, uh, you know what I mean? <laughs> and he cares. And, yeah, and, and he cares, and he's yeah. connecting. And then every single patient that leaves, I give them, and I'll show it up. I'll hold it up to you right now. This is my card. That I give to every single patient I got. And you know what it's got on there? It's got my cell phone number, my dental office number, my personal email, Howard at today's dental.com. So I get, I mean, when I get, uh, when some uh, number comes up on my iPhone and it's an area code 480 number, I mean, it, it's a 90% chance that it's some patient I gave. And the dentist, when I tell them that, they, they think that's a nightmare. They're like, damn, <laughs> I, don't, I don't want anybody calling me. It's like, dude, get over it. I mean, so, so you just want new patients for 40 years because they can't call. And you know what I'm also uh, very amazed at is nobody ever calls and wastes your time. Every time they call you, I'm so glad they did because they're even having an emergency or they're upset or they think they're not coming back. And by the way, when they're upset and your dentistry failed and the crown you did fell off and every nightmare you can think of, it's never the tooth you worked on. You know, you, you'll go in there and do a filling on a tooth. It's brand spanking new. Three months later, a filling falls out, but Occam's razor well, I went to Howard three months ago. He did a filling. A filling fell out. So Occam's Razor says, damn, that was your filling. Well, dude, you got 32 teeth, and, and you got 20 fillings in your mouth. And so, so I always take it with a grain of salt. All I try to do is close the cell. Well, when can I see it? And this is why my assistants hate me, because they, they say, well, when can I come in? And I always say, whatever you want. What's, <laughs> what's a good time tomorrow? And I'm not, I don't know the schedule. They say, well, how about 1030? Perfect. I'll see you tomorrow at 1030. And then, of course, I forget. So then at 1030, you know, they're all running back to me. Did you tell Mrs. Cranston she could just come down at 1030? And I'm like, yeah, I probably did. I don't know. But uh, hey, I call uh, it a, that's a good problem to have, right? Yeah. But uh, Dave, seriously, I'm a big fan of yours. Uh, a lot of my uh, um, classmates are big fans of yours. Um, I, I think that this, um, we, we got to innovate our way out of where we're at. And I sure hope you can send me a link because when you started the program, you said that, Dental income has been flat from general dentist income has been flat from 1997 to 2018. Yet dental revenue is up 70. percent I'd like to have the link to that. And in fact, you should post that. You should you should post that on Dental Town and say I just did a podcast with Howard. Um, it's his po- yeah. And um, you know, uh, okay. you, you should start a thread on that. Uh, right. I, I think that's amazing because that's what we're gonna have to do. That that's what every great civilization society do. You can't get rid of your problems. You have to innovate and use technology and outsmart your problems. And, and the definition of success is that, you know, a year from now, you have new problems. If you have the same problem a year from now, uh, you're, you're not working the problem. So, you know, it's like, it's like my success uh, of, of the president of the United States. Uh, when he left eight years later, did we have a whole set of new problems? Or did we have the same damn problems that when he walked into office eight years ago, and I pretty much say that I haven't lived, I probably have to live a hundred years before I ever uh, get surprised by a president that actually leaves office 
uh, was solving all their problems, and, and now we're into a whole group of new problems. And it's the same thing with your dental office, man. Dude, if you got the same problem that you did last year and the year before and the year before, you're not working the problem. You know what you're doing? Re- read uh, Tim Ferriss' book, The 4-Hour Workweek. You go in there, and all you're doing is all your rituals, and you're just working, 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 working. You're never working on the business. You're just working in the business. And, and I know dentists have to wear so many hats, but damn it, you need to work on the business. And, you, and I know what your problems are. We talk about them every day on my podcast. So just innovate your way out of your problems. And Dave, I love your innovation. Mm-hmm. Thanks for coming back on this show. Thanks for having me, Howard. I really enjoyed it. All right, buddy. Have a rocking hot day. Thank you, Ryan.